So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and for having me. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, Web3 and decentralization. Uh, so I will try to explain how it is um, uh, decentralization and what it actually means. And I will try to do it in an easy way because when I started with Web3, it was really difficult and I couldn't find something easy to understand. Uh, it was like complex um, um, things and I really want to uh, pass it to you, some information in the easiest way so everyone can understand it. I will introduce myself. As Jane said, I'm a developer lead at Scale in Paris. Uh, I'm from uh, Italy, I'm from Brescia, here nearby. <laughs> and uh, I am specialized in front-end. I really like front-end, I really like Angular in particular. And uh, I had some troubles with Web3 and Angular at the start because uh, the community of Web3 just works with uh, React. So I'm working on an uh, open source library with Angular that uh, uh, it's helpful for uh, building uh, Web3 applications. So I'm starting to be a Web3 enthusiast because I'm learning every day something new. And I am still um, don't have a uh, good um, uh, thoughts about it because I'm not a Web3 maximalist. I'm not here to tell you that Web3 is the future and uh, everyone needs to uh, move to Web3. Uh, so I'm just sharing my thoughts and what I'm having trouble with. So when we think about Web3, uh, the first thing that uh, came to our, our, our mind is crypto, uh, Bitcoin, uh, trading and all these tokens that uh, the price that go up and down with no control. We think about uh, the really expensive monkeys. Anyone bought an expensive monkey here? No one? Okay, good. <laughs> I don't uh, have anyone now. Uh, but it was like uh, a 2021 uh, trend, so maybe it's old now, uh, but uh, at the time when uh, you go on social media, everyone had these uh, ridiculous uh, monkeys as <laughs> um, profile pictures, you remembered it. And uh, now we have uh, actually avatars. Anyone have an avatar as a profile picture? No one? Okay, <laughs> good. It's not, uh, it's still strange, but yeah, it's trends, let's say. So when we talk about Web3, it came to our mind all these speculating things, but actually we are talking about technology today. So I will talk about Web3 as technology, not as a, a thing that we can use to have, uh, to be millionaires in uh, uh, just seconds or so. Uh, so when we talk about Web3, Web3 is actually a decentralized web. Decentralized means that we are using peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, that the protocols are open source, and we we'll use distributed ledger like blockchain. So when we talk about Web3, it's uh, always related to blockchain technology. So we need to talk about this. Uh, we have some pros and cons, so I'm not talking about just the uh, good things about Web3 because it's not that beautiful. So uh, the pros are uh, decentralization, of course. There is no um, central authority, uh, so it's uh, more a common decision for uh, what must be in there and what not. Uh, there is this ownership uh, pro that uh, 
every data that we, uh, we have and that we upload on Web3, it's ours. So uh, the ownership is really important and um, permissionless because uh, we don't have uh, to ask permission or to uh, give our data to, uh, I'll, uh, uh, to someone to uh, just uh, to join a, a Web3 application. We just need our wallet. With our wallet, we just uh, can explore everything on Web3. Important cons are complexity. As I said, it's really com uh, uh, the complexity and the um, curve, the learning curve is really high. So at the beginning, it's really hard to um, study it because there is no documentation, there is no examples that you can find really easy in, in the internet. So um, it's not easy. And uh, also the user adoption because uh, there is no, um, not much people that using uh, Web3. So uh, if you build an application, you don't have that uh, that much people using it. So this is uh, not helping. But the more important for me is scalability as a developer because it's just making things really hard. And we are coming back to this. Let's talk about Web3 development. So with the um, web application, we have this structure pretty much. Uh, so we have uh, the front end, the back end, and the database. This is classic, let's say, all in a web server. So this is what we know now. With Web3, we don't have the need of having a back end and a database because we talk directly with the blockchain. So we have smart contracts that are just um, programming that uh, automize some uh, actions um, to the blockchain. So uh, the front end just need to speak with these uh, smart contracts and uh, we get the data and write the data. We cannot delete or update any data. So we just need to read what's written in the blockchain and write some other, uh, other stuff. So just the front end and uh, the blockchain interaction. So this is what uh, everyone thinks is a decentralized app. So if uh, someone comes to you and tell you that he wants a decentralized application, you think of that structure. But when we think about decentralization, we think about uh, blockchain. Because it's really decentralized by definition. And uh, centralization needs it means that the central authority is not in the hand of one uh, person or one society, let's say. So uh, this gives us transparency and security. So this is what we expect. But a decentralized application, so a Web3 application, is really decentralized? This is the dilemma. So when we think about uh, a Web3 application, we have the front end that speaks with the blockchain. So the blockchain is decentralized by definition. We speak to the blockchain via smart contracts that are open source. Once you deploy it, it's open source. So everyone can read it. Everyone can see what's in it, what it does, everything. So it's decentralized, OK? But the front end, the front end is on a web server. And the web server, so it's deployed on, I don't know, Heroku, on AWS, on DigitalOcean, whatever you want. But this co is a company. So this is centralized. It's not decentralized. So the front end. If we deploy it in one of these uh, providers, let's say, it's actually centralized. Uh, they are starting to build 
some providers that deploy applications that are 100% decentralized, but till now they are not so efficient. So if you are, want to build an application, you don't want to uh, deploy it on an unstable uh, provider. So n no one is using it, or a little, little amount of people, and we don't consider that. So till now, the deployment is 100% centralized. And then we have the front end. The front end actually is not public because we don't publish the code of the, uh, of the front end uh, because it's private, it's a client product. So we usually don't uh, publish the code. And when you use an application, when you click on a button, it's maybe you want to buy an F uh, NFT that it's written that it costs one Ethereum. How you know that when you click buy, you actually send in one Ethereum and I'm, I'm not changing the number. So I have the control of what, I, what code I'm doing to the, the front end and what the user is receiving. So unless the front end is open source, it's still not decentralized, but it's kind of. But it's actually, we can say that the front end is centralized, 100%. So, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the blockchain block, uh, it's blue, and the web server is red, because the web server is centralized, and the blockchain um, block is decentralized. So, you have smart contracts and blockchain decentralized, front end, that is centralized. So if this is OK for us, this is OK. Is this OK too? So we can use a backend and a database to support our front end and have maybe a better performance and still have a Web3 application? Why not? Because it's still centralized. And in Web3, it's not a big deal that front-end is centralized because front-end just speaks with smart contracts. So everything that we are showing, that we are doing, it's actually verifiable. So it's not a big deal. And that's what we have to think about because sometimes we think, uh, I have to uh, build a Web3 application, a decentralized application, so I don't have to use a uh, backend, I don't have to use a database. This is not true. So I was think talking about scalability because the uh, really big problem about blockchain is that it is uh, really slow. So this is giving us uh, performance issues. So when we uh, build an application, we build it for a user that needs to have a good user experience. So he don't have to wait too long to get the data or don't wait too long to interact with our application. So we need to solve some issues uh, about performance. Let's make an example. We have an NFT marketplace. Uh, an NFT marketplace we are doing it this way, so the traditional uh, way for Web3 applications. Uh, the example have three collections, so three collections. Uh, on e uh, every collection, we have six NFTs. So imagine two uh, web pages. The first one have the three collections, and for each collection, when you click on it, you enter the detail and you see the six NFTs. To have uh, the information about the collections, you need four requests to the blockchain because you need, uh, you, you don't get like an array of data from uh, a smart contract, so you need a, a smart contract request for each information. And for each NFTs, you need a request from the smart contract and an HTTP request 
for the metadata that is like the image and uh, the name or the description of the um, of the NFT. So in total, to build this application, we need 30 uh, smart contract requests and 18 HTTP requests. It's pretty much, I think. So, as I said, for the, this is all the course that we need to do for the uh, first page, that is the collection list. Uh, we need the marketplace counter from the marketplace factory, that is a smart contract. We call this function to have how many collection we have. So, if the uh, marketplace counter is three, because we have three collections, we need to uh, ask for uh, the marketplace uh, smart contract uh, address for each one of them. So you cannot get like an array with the three marketplaces. Uh, you need for every uh, marketplace ID, let's say, um, make um, a smart contract call uh, with the function marketplace and pass the ID that is from zero to uh, the, um, the marketplace counter. So how many, if, if we have three, uh, the um, marketplace IDs will be zero, one, two. And then once we have this the um, address of the marketplace, we need the address of the uh, collection that we get uh, from the function NFT uh, from the marketplace uh, address. From the collection, we get the name uh, of the collection, and also from the collection address, we get the total supply that tell us how many NFTs we have. And then, this is for the detail, so for the page um, of the NFTs, we get, um, from the collection, we get the name, the total supply, how many NFTs we have, and for each NFTs, we need the token that is uh, the hash of the information about the NFT. And with an HTTP uh, call um, to EPFS, we get the information that we need to display our NFT. So this is the logic. Let's see how it will become if uh, we use a backend, so APIs, and we store in advance these informations in a database. So to do the same thing, we just need an HTTP request from, uh, to get the collection list and one HTTP request to get the collection detail. So two requests. The first one will be an array with all the informations about that we need to display in the, in the page. I added the imager because when you, you display like a collection, you want to see something about it. And for the um, uh, detail, we have the name on, of uh, the NFT, uh, the description, and uh, an imager. OK, I have a demo, actually, about this. Let's see. OK. So this is for the list of NFTs. This is what we want to get. Uh, let's see this so we can see some performance. So this is what it takes with smart contract. So we are not having any database. We just call the smart contract. So for this page, we took four seconds, it's still a lot because I have to wait. And it's, it's not good. Let's see for the detail. OK. So 16, what do you think? It's not really good, OK. We are all agree about this. Let's see how it performs with a backend. So 
less than a second. So, pretty much good. And the detail? No, it's not eight seconds. Okay, same. So, same. And we have just three collections. If we think about a marketplace NFT, we don't have three collections. I don't know if anyone have ever seen um, OpenSea Marketplace. It's the biggest marketplace. They don't have three collections. They have maybe 100 collections in their homepage. Do you think they are using uh, the decentralized uh, method to uh, make all the calls? I don't think so, because let's see it. Okay, it's pretty fast. I don't think they, they are calling directly the smart contract. And it is good, it's, it's fine, it's fine, we can do it. So don't trust who is telling you, no, you have to, don't use a database because it's not decentralized. It's not decentralized either, neither so. Okay, so what we need to build this application. We need Ether.js, it's JavaScript, so you can use it wherever you want. So the Web3 community uses just React, and they tell you to use just React, but actually what's uh, in the root of every uh, Web3 application is Ether.js. So it's JS, not React. So you can use it wherever you want. You use it on uh, also with uh, HTML, uh, vanilla JavaScript, uh, and uh, for a database, for a backend, you can use it. So you can store all the information in, the, in a database. You can use it with Angular, with TypeScript, uh, whatever you want. To import it, it's really simple. So it's just uh, npm install iters, and you have it all done. From it, you need just two classes to start. The first one is the provider class that allows us to interact uh, with the blockchain, and the contract class that um, is responsible to uh, connect directly with a smart contract. And this is the two operations that we can do. Uh, we can read from a smart contract and write. You cannot do anything else. Um, to know if a function is a read or a write, you can see it from the uh, state mutability um, attributes. It's, if it's view, it means that it's a write. If it's uh, payable or not payable, because the rights can be payable or not payable, it is a right. So you can uh, see it from here. You have, uh, this is a part of an ABI. The ABIs are uh, an interface, is an array of objects. Each object is a function of the uh, smart contract. And you can see from here, the name of the method that you want to, um, to request, the inputs that you uh, need to pass, and what's the output that you will get. And uh, the provider. The provider is very important because it allows us to interact with uh, the smart contracts. And we have two types of uh, uh, provider. We have the wallet provider, that you get it uh, from the wallet that you are using, that you are connecting with, that can be MetaMask or all the uh, browser extension uh, wallets or the um, application from your phone. So you can use all, uh, all the um, wallets that, that exist. I'm making uh, an example of uh, MetaMask because it's the most common. And then you have public notes or, or notes in general. Um, you can use the public ones that you can find um, on the uh, uh, network's um, web pages. Uh, they are public, but they are really slow. 
Uh, and then you can use these ones that are Alchemy, Quick Node, Infura, are the most common ones, are a little bit pricey, but it's more efficient, let's say. And let's see an example how we can get the uh, provider from a wallet. Um, in this case, for the MetaMask extension, we need to uh, bring the provider directly from the uh, window object. It's uh, under Ethereum. It's named Ethereum. Uh, and to have a Web3 provider that we, you, uh, we can use with Ethers, we need to create a new Web3 provider using the class uh, Ethers. And just passing uh, Ethers.provider.Web3 provider, we need uh, to pass the um, provider from the, um, from the w uh, window. And we have a Web3 provider that we can use. Same thing with public nodes. Uh, this is the URL uh, that I get from Binance. Uh, it's available on their website, so it's free. And you can, um, you can um, use it as a Web3 provider uh, using the provider's um, class with the method JSON RPC provider, and you pass the RPC uh, URL. And then with this provider, we can um, tell whatever, uh, we can uh, make whatever call to the smart contract we want. Uh, we just make sure that we are using the right provider because um, if we are doing a write, we can have a write uh, from the smart contract interaction. So we can read from, the smart con uh, from a smart contract directly uh, from the front end, or we can use the back end. So for the reads, we can use both. For the writes, uh, it's better. We can use uh, a backend as well, but it's better to use it directly, to interact with it directly from the front end because it's more uh, secure, let's say. And we don't have to um, store any data about this interaction because it's pretty much an interaction from uh, the user so, uh, and the um, wallet that I'm using. About the provider, if I am using uh, a read for the backend, I need public nodes because I cannot ask the, um, the user to connect their wallet and use the provider from the wallet to do an interaction from um, a backend because the backend maybe uh, stores the data when the application is not working. So we need something that is uh, every um, that is available uh, every time. So uh, public nodes are uh, the best choice. And then for um, the reads, uh, for the writes, sorry, um, we are uh, interacting directly from the front end, and we need. Uh, only the uh, provider of the wallet. So we cannot use public nodes to make a write because we need to sign every transaction. And every transaction has a cost, so we have to pay for it. So the wallet is, uh, we need to use it. And then if we have to read from the smart contract and we are reading directly from the front end, we can use both. We can use uh, the wallet provider if the uh, user is already connected, or you, we can use the uh, public nodes uh, if we don't want to um, make the user connect their wallet before seeing data. Because, uh, for example, for an NFT marketplace, I want to see the NFTs before connecting my wallet. Maybe I just want to have a look. I don't have to connect my wallet unless I want to uh, buy something. And yeah, I am leaving the demo on my GitHub. 
so you can try it out. You can find also the slides on the readme of this uh, repository. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's uh, I, for me always decentralized applications were a little bit mysterious, but it's uh, <laughs> helped clear it up really good. Thank you. Thank Are there you. any questions in the audience? Nothing. Um, well, I have a question. So, how do you see the how do you see decentralized applications evolve in the future? Do you are there any trends? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, nowadays, we see a lot of NFT marketplace. Of course, um, it was a trend of 2021, but it's still um, making uh, progress because uh, now NFTs are not like used only for art is using also for um, like a proof of authenticity uh, authenticity or uh, and also as ownership of something and uh, we have defi project we have uh, social media still early stage but we have something about it and we have gaming of course uh, play to earn uh, applications and uh, yeah pretty much we have also on the uh, industry, um, we have more uh, protocols about timestamping, something like that. Yeah. Thanks. Any, any other questions? No? Then thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Oh.